are going to take a minute or two to let everybody get logged in. Thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Lauren Stiles. I'm the president and founder of Dysautonomia International, and I'm very uh, pleased to be joined this evening by Daniel Lee, who is the one of the inventors of uh, the Stat Health ear device that many in our patient community have been talking about lately. And so Dysautonomy International invited Daniel to present. There were so many questions um, on the patient groups and even from a lot of doctors that are interested in this device. We thought it'd be good to have our patient community learn about it. I want to be upfront. Daniel did not give us any money to do this. We did not ask. We just invited him because we think this is a pretty cool technology. And um, we just want patients and families and, and doctors to have access to, you know, innovative information on innovative things that are happening in our community. So with that, um, I'm actually going to pass it over to Daniel to present some slides. We're going to talk about some of the research going on with this device, um, and Daniel will talk a little bit about how it works. And then after that, we'll have a Q&A. So if you have any questions during the presentation, you can type your questions into the chat. Um, we had over 1,500 people register for the webinar, so I don't think we're going to get to everybody's questions, but we'll try. And uh, I know that there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of people who have a lot of questions. So we're excited to have this opportunity to talk with Daniel about these things. All right, so I'm passing it over to you, Daniel. I'll turn my camera off. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Lauren, for the opportunity to share. Um, should I give another minute or so or just jump right into it? I'll just I'll just jump right into it. It's recorded. Yeah, I well, think I... jump in. And I do want to mention to anyone, it's this is being recorded. So um if you have to leave at some point, don't worry, you'll you'll get an email recording of the video. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you all see it? It looks like it's going, so I'll just jump right into it. So nice yes. to meet you all. Awesome, thanks. Well, nice to meet you all. Thank you, thanks again, Lauren, for the opportunity. Um, so I'll be just be sharing primarily a lot more around the science and the research that we're doing. This is more, just more educational as intent. Uh, we've been doing a lot to try to advance just knowledge of these conditions with the device and technology we've been building. So we'll be sharing mostly about that in today's talk. So first I'll give a little bit of, of the backstory, just like how I initially got into this. My dad has uh, uh, very severe orthostatic hypertension. He's been falling for many, many years. Uh, now, almost three and a half years ago, he fell and broke six ribs. So that's initially how I initially was trying to understand what's going on with my dad, what's going on with these conditions. And uh, and then stumble into the world of dysautonomia. So that's that's a little bit about how I initially got um, got into this world. Now the existing metrics um, for as you all know many times do not correlate with how you're feeling. We very often see people saying and the people we speak with saying, "Why do I feel so bad? I keep measuring my heart rate and my blood pressure. That's what people are telling me I need to be measuring, but they're fine. They seem normal." And that's what the doctors see too very often because the doctors don't really have the right objective tools to be able to measure the abnormal physiology, the physiology that's going on in these conditions. And because of that, I'm sure you've all heard the it's all in your head um, just because they can't really see that anything is objectively wrong. The irony is that it is all in your head, literally. The reason that my dad passes out and why many people feel these symptoms is because when you stand up, this, as this little stick figure does, Gravity pulls blood into your legs, so the blood doesn't make it back up to your heart, and it needs to make it back up to your heart in order to get pumped to your brain. So that's basically what's happening. You can see flow dropped, um, and then as soon as you lay back down, as you'll also experience that that those symptoms recover quite rapidly because you're now getting the blood back into your heart. Uh, as you can see in this uh, example here, there was actually not a drop in heart rate or blood pressure. That's what a, a physician is trained to look for to see, oh, maybe they're not getting enough blood flow to the rest of their body. But very often, heart rate and blood pressure are actually going in the opposite direction. This has been shown on thousands of patients at multiple different clinical research institutions like Harvard. This study that uh, Dr. Novak at Brigham published was 744 patients, but he's done like thousands. Uh, Johns Hopkins has seen this very often as well. Johns Hopkins uh, has this quote here, cerebral blood flow is a critical missing vital sign. Uh, it's not easy to measure cerebral blood flow though. So most clinics approximate using heart rate and blood pressure, which are secondary metrics and which often mislead. And so that's, um, that's, so that's why you gotta be measuring cerebral blood flow. Now, this has been shown, here's a couple more studies so you can get a sense of what's going on here. So this was uh, uh, Dr. Visser and Van Campen in the Netherlands combined with Dr. Peter Rowe at Johns Hopkins. They published on uh, patients on their tilt where healthy controls, as you can see in the red chart, they have like a five to 7% drop in their cerebral blood flow when you tilt them up. 
but then MECFS, MECFS patients, as well as orthostatic hypotension patients, as well as POTS patients, they all have like significant 20, 30% drops in blood flow to the head or cerebral blood flow. Uh, this has also been demonstrated in long COVID. Uh, the, doctor, the, the Johns Hopkins and uh, Netherlands group has demonstrated this as well in a larger cohort, but sharing some of Dr. Novak's work at Harvard, where you can see it's kind of a small screen here, but the top left chart shows that cerebral blood flow is continuously low for the blue line, which is long COVID. Red line is POTS and green line is healthy control. So there's a very significant drop in blood flow. All right, so that's where STAT comes in. So STAT is a tiny discrete near wearable um, that continuously monitors blood flow to the head 24 seven. Uh, it's right there and we tap into a shallow ear artery. Um, and so uh, this ear artery is a offshoot of the external carotid. I'll get into that in a moment, um, but this is, a, an ideal window into the brain and heart because we get a nice strong arterial signal here and it's very close in proximity to what matters. So we're, what we're trying to build with this is, is very similar to what continuous glucose monitors did for diabetics, but more for like various cardiovascular conditions, primarily orthostatics. So how do we actually measure blood flow to the head? So we call it blood flow to the head very intentionally because it's a proxy for cerebral blood flow. We're not actually measuring blood flow to your brain, but it's to your head in general, which we're showing in certain situations are well correlated. So we're measuring flow changes in the external carotid artery. You can see these two uh, arrows here. So off of your heart, uh, there's something called the carotid artery that climbs up your neck. And that carotid splits into an internal carotid, which feeds like 70% of the blood flow to your brain. And then the external carotid, which you can see snakes up and it goes actually like it feeds your face and goes behind your ear and pokes through your ear. So we're actually looking at flow changes in the external carotid and, and then inferring from that what's changing in flow to the internal carotid. Now this holds in orthostatic syndromes particularly because the physiology, as I mentioned earlier, is orthostasis, which means upon uh, standing. So standing causes a preload drop. Preload is a medical term for how much uh, blood preloads or fills the heart before it pumps. Be so, so there's a drop in how much blood fills the heart. And because of that, every time your heart pumps, less blood leaves the heart with each pump because it's hard to squeeze something out of an empty sac. So you need to fill the sac in order to really get a nice full pump out of it. And then, and so that is what's actually causing the reduced blood flow to the head because you're actually, with each pump, you're pumping less blood out. And because that is now coming from your heart, that affects both the flow to your internal and your external carotid. It's not as much, there's some like local effects inside of your brain where it might make it harder for blood to get in. But the majority for orthostatic syndromes is actually due to not enough heart, blood leaving your heart. And so this is what stat measures. So this is actually the raw waveform data where when this is a, a patient during a tilt table test at Johns Hopkins, but uh, you can see we have a nice full waveform on the top. This is the baseline when the patient had normal flow and didn't really have symptoms. And the bottom is when the patient was very symptomatic and they were uh, a minute after they had passed out experienced syncope. But you can see the fullness of the waveform is very different. The top one is very full. It's a nice long full pulse. The, the bottom one is very spurty because the heart's dry heaving and it's like getting very little blood out with each pump. So we've actually tested this simultaneously with TCD ultrasound. So that's one of the ways that you can measure blood flow to the head um, currently in a clinical setting where you put an ultrasound probe and try to measure blood to the middle cerebral artery. Um, so uh, you can see that the stat device and the waveform we have on the external carotid looks very, it mirrors the, the TCD ultrasound uh, waveform. So the morphology shape is very similar and that's the morphology that we're looking at when, when the flow changes. All right, so we've actually done this uh, in various different tilt table environments. So we tested it um, uh, courtesy of uh, Dr. Murat Fodim at, over at Duke, but he tested STAT against much more obtrusive clinical monitors, such as this continuous blood pressure dual finger cuff that gets B2B blood pressure, as well as TCD ultrasound to measure blood flow to the head. And in that study, we saw actually a really nice concordance of the STAT waveform. So STAT is in green. Uh, this is or the outputs of the stat device is a is a uh, flow index and that fl oh, this label is actually wrong but the flow index um, and then the blood pressure uh, from the cuff they were actually tracking very nicely. Sorry, this is okay. That's why this is our pressure index. Green is in is the pressure index and that was actually tracking really nicely with the blood pressure um, from the the cuff devices. So you saw actually a blood pressure rise and then a big dip as the patient passed out and stat tracked that trend very nicely. And also here's another patient that where this is comparing in blue is the ultrasound's blood flow and in green is the stats flow index. 
and then you can see that and uh, the blue was dropping and it had a big dip around 1040 and the patient almost passed out there. And the uh, stat device also saw a big drop in the flow index. All right, so um, we've done actually like 50 patients over, I think it was around 50 patients at Duke with TCD. We've also done another like 27 internally in our lab here, maybe 30 or something. But uh, we've generally had some difficulty. TCD is very hard to get really good signal quality consistently. It's it's very challenging. There's only a handful of labs that actually do it because it's so challenging to get a good signal. And so we've actually been trying to uh, validate against a different reference. And we've learned uh, courtesy of uh, the Dr. Peter Rowe and Dr. Bisser and Van Kampen in the Netherlands uh, that have been pioneering a lot of this research. Uh, we learned how to do the carotid ultrasound technique. That's the technique they use to measure blood flow to the head. So this is an ultrasound probe on the uh, carotid be before getting to the head, because a big part of it is getting through the skull, which TCD ultrasound has to do, and it's very hard to do that. And so, yeah, if you just measure the blood flowing into the head, you can. that's a much easier way to me measure flow. So we we went over, they graciously hosted me uh, over in the Netherlands for a few days, where we put our device on, it was just a really a quick proof of concept, six MECFS patients and one healthy volunteer. And we were just looking at, they measured both internal carotid and external carotid, and they were looking at flow changes. Um, and the MECFS patient here, so this is one that had confirmed reduced blood flow, they had a 35% drop in the internal carotid artery flow. You can see the external carotid artery ultrasound, so that's the, the yellow uh, pulse, that also had a big drop, um, and that actually mirrored the stat, uh, stat blood flow waveform. So the top charts are supine, so upon when, when they were laying down, and the bottom charts are when they went upright, and we're looking at what was going on in the internal carotid, external carotid, and the stat device. And you can see in the in ICA and the stat device, they both registered big drops in flow. And so that's that's uh, a good true positive. We had our one true negative, which at when the when the true negative was tilted up, we didn't really see a drop in flow, and uh, and also in in both the uh, the in ICA as well as what stat measured. So this is pretty promising for us in seeing stat is. Uh, against that it looks promising but it's only an n of seven um group and so we need to like have a larger data set for this so that's one of the kind of research paths that i'll share a little bit more on later um so so that's against carotid ultrasound this is a separate study we discussed a lot of this is familiar to an audience to the audience if you've heard my previous talks i'm just trying to get through some of the the, the past work uh, but at Johns Hopkins, we put the device on patients when they're undergoing tilt. We, we published this in Jack EP uh, earlier this year. But basically, we saw drops in blood flow to the head, and Stat was able to observe that happening minutes before these patients passed out. Um, so yeah, you can see that's pretty clear. All right, so historically, we've been doing a lot of kind of like tilt table environment studies. Um, but more recently, we've, we've been focusing our research on, on the real world, like what happens at home, because the tilt environment is an artificial environment which has known issues with diagnostic yield. There's known like it's it's there's some benefit to like of things that can see that other tests cannot see, but it oftentimes misses orthostatic syndromes that are highly variable day to day to day. Like you, so so that's kind of where we're we're focusing more on what happens in real life. And uh, so our focus. So in order to study that. Stat has to be able to detect when someone stands up uh, naturally at home and just auto detect that. And so that's one of the unique thing that, things that Stat is able to do very reliably that other wearables frankly have a difficult time doing because Stat is on your head. It undergoes the largest vertical changes when you stand up versus like wrist wearables other other locations may not, they, they don't see that very often when you stand up, just think about what happens to your hand. And so this is one of our, uh, like our, uh, our body, context algorithm that detects whether someone was standing, if they sat down, if they laid down, if they're walking, running, or if they're just like static. And uh, basically what you're looking for, this is an ROC curve. This is a little data science-y, but basically the more you fill out the curve, the more these dots and uh, are further up to the left, that's like a perfect test. And so you want to get close to that. No test is like perfect generally, but we're getting pretty, pretty close with these uh, very good AUCs. So the way that we use this stand is we see when you stand up naturally at home, how does your flow um, flow score as well as your flow index and your heart rate change in response to that stand? And so we we actually auto detect each time what what is happening in these. How's your body responding to every stand at home? All right. 
So now I'm going to actually share, this is a little bit new data or new analysis. So this was, many of you actually participated in this. Um, back at the, this Autonomia International Conference back in July, we had uh, conference attendees stop by our booth. Uh, we were there with the SAT device, and we had them lay down for five minutes. People just signed up. We filled out the slots really quickly, and then they stood up for five minutes, and then we looked at what SAT was seeing on uh, these people. Um, and these are people that uh, had self-reported uh, dysautonomia diagnoses, POTS, MECFS, dysautonomia. Um, and then afterwards, uh, after I had figured out exactly who are um, like what the age and gender was of the conference attendees, I went and recruited uh, like age and gender match healthy controls to try to compare what is a healthy, what is that seeing a healthy control when they stand up versus people that have self-reported orthostatic intolerance. And uh, and then the protocol, yeah, we had to lay down for five minutes and stand up. Every minute we asked them on a scale of zero to five that you see here on the right, how severe their symptoms were. We were not specific in how, what symptoms they're experiencing. We just said, however you experience symptoms, Perhaps in future studies, we'll get more specific on making them blood flow to head related, like dizziness or, or lightheadedness. Um, and I just want to acknowledge also that this is not an ideal test in that a longer test would be much more sensitive, much more specific, much more standard. But it was a conference environment, so we had to kind of abbreviate it. Ideally, it would have been a 10-minute stand, but we just uh, like uh, only kept it to a five-minute stand. Uh, so you can see that the basic demographics, 33, average age, we can try to ma match that with the healthy controls. Uh, the healthy controls were a little bit shorter, a little bit lighter than the orthostatic intolerant, but otherwise very similar, 20, uh, 20 all-female, all 10 healthy controls, all-female. Uh, one thing to note about this is unlike a tilt table environment, these are people in the real world that are actively attending a conference. So they're they're taking all the fluids, they're they're on their electrolytes. They are uh, many of them actually had IV fluids that day or the day before, and uh, they're seventy-one percent of them were on some hemodynamic altering drug from a beta blocker to fludro or evabradine, and so they're actively on medication. So it's, it does change their medications are changing the physiology a bit from the the prior literature. Despite that, um, so we'll look at actually the data. So this is the average data for in red is the orthostatic intolerant and blue is the healthy controls. And uh, the first five minutes, people were laying down. Uh, we can look at their symptoms. We normalized their symptoms to uh, made made a symptom change from the minute four to five window. So you'll see for both orthostatic intolerant and healthy controls, minute four and five are both at zero. And we're looking at changes from that. The reason for that is some people were already symptomatic. Even when they got to our table, they already had like a three. And when they laid down, they might have gotten down to a two. So we we wanted to make sure we could level set everyone to see what was caused by standing up, well, the orthostatic changes in their symptoms. So you can see the orthostatic were very symptomatic. Uh, orthostatic intolerant, they're still very symptomatic. They were at like a, almost a three um, at, at the after five minutes of standing. <laughs> what we saw in the uh, flow index or SATS blood flow to head index is we saw a decent drop in uh, flow to the head. So healthy controls had roughly a 6.6% uh, drop in flow, whereas that was seeing on average like a 6 16, 17 drop in flows. There was definitely a significant difference between the two populations. Uh, our blood pressure index that we also have uh, didn't actually, they were very close. Um, so there's, it was not actually worth calling out the amount. And then the heart rate change, which is very, this threw us off for a while, is the orthostatic intolerant only had on average a 15.6 BPM rise in the heart rate, which I think the vast majority of them were POTS patients, which means that you experience a 30 BPM rise on standing. So we were actually very taken aback by this data initially. And that's when we realized, wait, they're all on their hemodynamic medications. They're on, they're, they're, it's a very, they're, they're fully strapped in, they're ready for this conference. So that's how we kind of have made sense of like, why is a POTS, primarily POTS population not having a POTS response? It's because they're in the real world on their medications. And so they only had a 15 uh, BPM rise versus on average, you only have like 11.4 BPM rise in five minutes for the healthy controls. Now, from this data, we did a correlation analysis because I was very curious, like how did the symptoms correlate with blood flow, heart rate, and uh, the blood pressure trending algorithm that we have? And uh, so heart rate actually didn't track and didn't trend uh, well at all. So we did a Pearson and Spearman correlation analysis. So this is just uh, basically, these numbers are the closer to an absolute value of one you have. So these are 0.15 and 0.14. The closer you have to one, the closer, the better of a correlation it is. So 0 0.15, 0 0.14 is a very weak correlation. But then 
you have to also look at the p-values, which tells you, is it statistically significant? And these these are way too high. You want to have a much smaller p-values for it to even like uh, conclude that there is a correlation here. So basically, there was no actual correlation with heart rate and symptom scores. Because as you can see, the healthy controls in blue had this, a very similar, and they had no symptoms, they had very similar uh, heart rate rises to the orthostatic intolerant, except for a handful of people that had like 35 to 40 BPM heart rate rises, but the vast majority were actually had very small heart rate rises. So we also looked at a pressure index. Also, again, p-values are garbage, 0 0.7, 0 0.67. There wasn't really a correlation with symptoms and our pressure index. But then this is where the blood flow, our flow index actually is tracking very nicely. So we had Pearson and Spearman correlation coefficients of 0.46. And there was, significant, there was a very statistically significant with very tiny p-values. Um, but we were like 0.46, which is like a moderate to strong correlation. And so you can see like generally when the flow index drops and it's lower that you start to have more symptoms. And these only the orthostatic intolerant were having these really big drops in flow, which like if you just looked at heart rate and these other metrics, you would think, oh, you're fine. We we got your metrics under control, but actually the vast majority of them have significant drops in flow. And that's what actually explains the symptoms that they're reporting to us. And so the conclusion here is blood flow of the head correlates with symptoms better than heart rate and stats blood pressure index. This is true of the ultrasound method, and we're just starting to show that this is also true, and stat can see this as well. And current medical treatments are all targeting like heart rate and blood pressure regulation. Um, and they're doing a good job because like these are re relatively normal, like the heart rate was not going as high for the most most people, but they the symptoms are still not addressed and blood flow is still not addressed. And so that's that's actually a very key takeaway is, and that's what one of their goals is to try to give pharma, give doctors, give them the right target that actually correlates with symptoms so that we can try to improve quality of life. So. Um, so this is general, generally like a, a general uh, uh, correlation analysis across like all of our part uh, the, the, all of the uh, all the participants. But the when you get you can actually get much more detailed, uh, much tighter correlations if you're personalizing a model per individual. Because for one person, uh, twenty let's say for heart rate, the twenty BPM rise might not be anything. You're fine. But for someone else, a 20 BPM rise might actually be very symptomatic because everyone's heart and their metrics are different. So we want to personalize per individual. And so this just starts to show you how you can get much stronger correlations and have a much better ability to predict symptoms if you personalize a, a, a fit. So here we have our flow index against symptoms for a single person. And if you look at a single person for this person, a three to four symptom score delta a change is correlated with like a 30% drop, but we can build that much more tightly um, she's just another one, but the key point is you can create stronger correlation models if you make them personalized versus generalizable criteria. And that's kind of where we're going. All right, new study that we've done is two-day CPET. So uh, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with this. So I'll explain it very briefly. And this is uh, courtesy of Workwell Foundation. Stacy and Jared over uh, Stevens over at Workwell have been helping out um, to just do a proof of concept in this as well. So. 2D CPET is more in the world of MECFS, but it's a, a it's a test to uh, show that in general, like if there's this, so there's this concept um, in like POTS dysautonomy world, it's more often called like a flare. In uh, in MECFS world, it's called PEM or post exertional malaise. But I think many of you all have experienced like a level of overexertion, and then you might actually be like out of commission. Your symptoms are way worse than normal for days, weeks, even a month plus. Um, and so that uh, what two-day CPET is actually doing, so so PEM and flares are very unique to like orth like uh, orthostatic syndromes uh, to MECFS particularly, but a lot of POTS dysautonomia experiences as well. Um, and so what two-day CPET does is um, it's actually characterizing, you, you have people go on a bike, and go at max exertion and see how well their body's able to ge generate power and generate energy while on a bike. And then, uh, so day one, because you went so hard, it often causes people to be in a flare and it be in PEM. So on day two, when they go on the bike again, because they're in that flare and they're in that PEM, they actually can't reproduce the same amount of, of uh, power and, and, and energy on the bike. They have like, I mean, I think I've seen 30% drops, but it's very abnormal because with uh, people that don't have these, like a, a PEM or a flare up, they're able to reproduce very repeatably the same amount of power and energy. And like, uh, and, and they verify like effort through like your ventilation there's, there's a lot that they do with how you're actually expiring CO2 and, and oxygen. And anyways, 
I'm not going to get into that fully, but the idea is it causes PEM and it observes PEM and it shows PEM is, is, is happening very objectively. And this is like a very like robust diagnostic approach. It is not accessible or it's hard to, it's hard to pull off. Um, and it does cause, a, intentionally is causing a flare. So there is, uh, it's not going to be for everybody, but um, that that is uh, what uh, TDAC PET is. And so we wanted to see what, with the SAT device, because we're trying to understand people in the real world as people are experiencing PEM and flare-ups, what does STAT see? So we actually had them wear a, a, a STAT and we actually did a, a, a 10 minute uh, latest scan. Um, so we could just get initial orthostatic vitals and then did day one CPET, so one on the bike, and then day two did another uh, uh, latest stand. And so, uh, uh, so, so we, this is only an N of two where we had one um, one participant, and then I was the healthy control going doing the two day CPET. And uh, this is what we saw on day one higher. Uh, so this is a confirmed MECFS participant um, who. Uh, when when uh, laying to us, uh, so this is when when she was laying and then she stood up, and our flow index was like roughly at an 18, and then when she stood up, the flow index dropped to like a 16, and then sort of recovered ish when she uh, laid back down. Um, the heart rate started off at 54 beats per minute and only had like a nine BPM rise. She didn't. She doesn't definitely doesn't have a POTS response, um, and she was pretty symptomatic in this window. And then on day two, though, so after this, she went on the bike, then came back on day two. And did the same thing, lay down and stood up. But on day two, we actually started baseline when she was laying down, same exact time period. Her heart rate was the same, 54 beats per minute, but she started at like a 15 flow index. So she was already baseline lower so back to day one versus day two. So already flow was not flowing. And when she stood up, flow index dropped a little bit even lower. This time, heart rate had a little bit more of an orthostatic response. So I mean, slightly uh, higher heart rate rise and again, a recovery, but and then, and then she went on to do the day, day two CPET on the bike, and she, I, I forget the exact number, I should have pulled this in, but I think it was like a 25% drop in how much she could actually produce um, energy. And, and so that's actually like, we've, they've seen um, in, there's various different forms of CPET, but uh, in general, flow is reduced, um, that's known, but like we, what we saw is a day one to day two change in how much flow is reduced. Uh, it's been shown that flow is reduced generally, but also from day, on day two, it seems from this N of one study that uh, the hypothesis is you actually exacerbate your flow. And so that's part of how we're gonna be tying that into like uh, like our research. So you can actually zoom in um, to look at the uh, the waveform um, of the, from the SAT device on day one when she was supine and the flow index was 18. So you can see the relative I mean, compared the top fullness of the waveform to the bottom fullness, you can see that at the same heart rate, the flow index, so the heart rate is still about 54 beats per minute, but the flow index is lower because the fullness of the waveform on the bottom is narrower. It's not as full on the top, it's more spurty. And so uh, that's what's going on there. Um, and then this is for me, uh, this is my supine period prior to doing the CPAT. Uh, and you can see that there's not really much of a change in the pulse waveforms fullness from day one to day two at the same heart rate. So that was a very interesting finding that we're going to try to be doing more of on a larger scale because this is, again, only an N of two. <laughs> um, so preliminary hypotheses, again, we need more N size or more people, or scientific word is N size. Um, but it does look like PEM and flares have associated, they have a reduced blood flow from this. We want to prove this again on a large scale, but that's what, and it makes sense. That's maybe causing why you, you have very little energy and fatigue. And then, uh, and you can see also from this that even at the same heart rate, you're missing, it's missing the key physio physiology. There's not really, you can't see that there's reduced flow. It's just, oh, 54 beats per minute. It looks like it's fine, it's normal, but you're not looking at the right thing. Um, <laughs> all right, so future research studies. So uh, we wanna be doing more of the latest stand, not as much on the tilt. Um, it's just, uh, so, so we wanna do that larger and more diver diverse scale. So we actually are, when we're doing a number of different studies, but one that is actively recruiting that we I can bring up now is uh, MIT. They have a big maestro study. I think they're recruiting 240, maybe 300 people with long COVID, with chronic Lyme, with uh, a variety of orthostatic um, uh, uh, syndromes. They're just really trying to discover biomarkers to help this community, and we're supporting their research by helping them now have a way to measure our, our blood flow correlate. Um, so we'll be you can actually sign up on their website. They're still actively recruiting. Uh, we're gonna be doing more extracranial. So this is a carotid ultrasound validation. Uh, we've been just trying to get, figure out which 
exact ultrasound probe we want to use in the, the, the setup, but that is on our, uh, we've been working on that. Um, and then uh, we want to be doing some more two-day CPIT with uh, the Werkel Foundation and Stacy. Uh, we want to do what we saw earlier, but try to do that at a little bit at a larger scale and see how that varies. Um, uh, and we also, what we want to do is not just during the two, like after CPET day um, two, yes, there's reduced, there's greater PEM, but what happens in day three, day four, day five longitudinally, because many times the flares and the PEMs are, are days, weeks long. And when we, what we were very curious to see what does flow look like when there's known PEM induced by CPET and then see how that kind of uh, recovers and changes over time. And so that's these are some of the types of research questions that we're going to be going and trying to help uh, provide insights on. And this other one is another, it's an interesting novel way, I'd say, of getting very la large scale real world orthostatics is, I mean, it is a commercial wearable that we are like, we have like did a crowdfunding, almost done with a crowdfunding campaign for, but the idea and the hope here is like, I mean, we're kind of orthostat is like a scientific study name that we're trying to collect large scale stats or data on orthostatics on uh, hundreds of thousands of patient days of data. And, and so that's kind of the goal here is 100,000 plus patient days. And we want to actually be open sourcing this. This is, of course, opt in. So not everyone, you're not, you have to uh, agree to wanting to provide your data into this data set. But then we want to open source that to identify data for researchers uh, to, to analyze and learn more about insights of blood flow, of heart rate, of our pressure index in the real world um, and see how other factors and help us analyze the data. It's way too much data for us to make sense of, but we want to like provide this to the scientific community to to better understand. And this is like a that's a crowdsourced research effort. So that uh so that's what orthostat is. And and part of the why we're doing all this is so we're doing a lot of research. These are not even doesn't cover everything that we, we've been doing, but uh one of the reasons is like it's ongoing validation for the device in the hopes that we are working and uh, having a uh, regulatory strategy to get FDA approval. We also want to get um, insurance inclusion for some amount of reimbursement. Um, for a couple of indications, we're looking at being kind of like an alternate to tilt table testing because tilt tables are like backed up for like one to two years and that's often gating treatments from, from you being able to try treatments. So we want to try to make a more easier way that the doctor can just say, hey, wear the SAT device for two weeks and I'll get a report. And, and we, we can use that to make the diagnosis and then try treatment. So that is uh, one of the uh, ways that we want to be helping, but because um, we can actually see what's going on, like be a telescope into the physiology in the real world. But that requires a lot of validation years and uh, of, of, of work. And so, uh, but that's part of why we're building all this and doing all this research. Uh, also, we're trying to increase as uh, as you may know, not many people know about this blood flow thing. Uh, the top doctors in this space are like very well aware of it, but the, your average physician is very unfamiliar that blood flow is abnormal. And so they're just looking at the heart rate and blood pressure. So we're trying to increase awareness of this key physiology uh, by actually being able to measure it finally. And then also giving the ability for now people to target correctly because you're targeting the wrong metrics with heart rate and blood pressure. If you can actually target and try to improve flow, then we can actually start to like um, have the right goal of what we're trying to improve. And, and then also like all of this is, we're just trying to improve improve the scientific understanding of these conditions. Because you're, these, I mean, we have it's said here, your experience deserves understanding. You've been, ex we've seen so many, so much like pain from people just getting, uh, I mean, it's just really sad stories. And so, uh, yeah, so we want to just try to help make the, make people like just, resolve all of the messiness that is currently how these hand, uh, conditions are being handled. So uh, yeah, so I should talk as a research update, I should talk limitations. So um, we um, so we don't actually track local flow changes inside the skull. As I mentioned earlier, we're measuring the external carotid. And so for example, if you're having a stroke, that's a stroke inside of your brain. We're not gonna see that. We think we're not gonna see that. Also, if you hyperventilate, for example, that actually changes CO2 levels in your body that makes only or primarily the blood vessels inside of your head constrict. So it's harder to push blood in, but that doesn't affect the external carotid as much. So we can actually be quite off in that environment as well. And there's there's a few con uh, situations where the uh, the out external carotid is gonna be affected differently than internal carotid. So we cannot be a substance, we, we can't be called cerebral blood flow. We are a, we're, a, we're a proxy for that in kind of limited scenarios, but 
the scenarios is when you stand up, how's it change? And that's what that's what we're primarily looking at. Also, um, so ears are very hard. I mean, we've been working this problem for a long time and uh, uh, to, to get a right fit, it, there's a custom fit required and there's di many different modular elements to get this. And, and it's very important in order to get enough good enough signal quality and comfort. And so um, that is, uh, what we are, um, so so that's 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 a no limitation. It's not just as easy as like, oh, just take one and give it to someone else. Like we actually have a little bit of a custom fitting process and not all ears, we may not be able to fit all ears. We're trying to improve how many we can cover, but uh, yeah, uh, so that there's a no limitation there. But all right, I'm not gonna be able to go through all the acknowledgements here, but a lot of various people have been very gracious to support our research and help us try to get off the ground. We're still a startup, so we've been it's been a lot of favors and people just trying to help out the research and running various like free studies and like uh, and and uh, validation studies and 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 so so there's a lot of people helping out. Um, and uh, this is recorded, so you can take a look here later. And that's about it. We wanted to leave some time for questions, but thanks for listening. Thanks, Daniel, so much. Um, you, if you want to stop sharing your slides, maybe we can go on screen and chat together. Oh, I should probably turn on my camera. Okay, so we've got a ton of questions, and I thank everyone because they're really good questions. I know that um, that was kind of science heavy, and so some a lot of the terms were things we don't often hear about in the patient community, but um, the big picture is, you know, I think it's such a cool goal to try to shift the conversation that it's not just about our heart rate and blood pressure. There's actually older research in POTS showing that the heart rate change doesn't really correlate to the severity of the symptoms, which baffles doctors. Well, you know, maybe this is why, maybe because uh, the severity of the symptoms might be driven more by um, how much you are not getting good blood flow to the upper body. So, so I'll take some, um, I'm gonna go through the questions. If I don't get to your question, please don't be mad because there's probably far more than we could get to in the time allotted. Um, and I might also just summarize because some people have very similar questions. So the, probably one of the biggest ones, we have an international audience. Um, right now, this is uh, for people in the USA. What are your plans for sort of international access? Yeah, I mean, we kind of have to like. There's, I mean, we're we going international has. There's a lot of different regulations that we have to comply with. Uh, I think in general, like we can't commit to a hard timeline right now, but it's going to be like we have to kind of see how the U.S. launch is going first. And so it's it's kind of a wait and see. From we're going to be shipping the beta customer units in like April of 2024, and then that's really going to be the time that we'll really start to understand like our timelines because. If things are going fantastic and the beta is working well and we're actually helping people at a good scale, then we want to scale it. But we don't want to scale it until we know that it's really helpful and that we're 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 positively making a difference in the right way. And so that's I think that's probably the key decision node that helps us know is it time to scale or is it still like we want to stay in beta for a little bit longer. So can't commit to a timeline. It's a lot of it is contingent on on data on are we helping and the beta customers are going to help us with that. Yeah. Um, can you talk about whether it's waterproof or water resistant, or can you shower with it? Can you go in the pool with it? Yep. Uh, I mean, we're trying to make it access, like be able to be set and forget and put it in your ear and leave it in your ear, like indefinitely. And so uh, we has to be, you can, it has to be at least shower proof. And so that's a core requirement. Uh, I, I, so my previous uh, startup uh, was, was or was basically both sleep buds, which we were able to get really good water water resistance, and we're using similar similar ways of like ensuring a, a seal. So I think we it's possible we may be swimming compatible, but we're not committing to that as a hard requirement. We or we're committing to shower shower resistance as a hard requirement. It's likely that we'll get more than that, but that's that's a uh, nice to have. Yeah. Um, can you explain a bit about, so we've seen the photos, um, the the earlier photos of the sort of nice, sophisticated, sleek looking ear device, the photos you just showed or the sizing, the little plasticky kind of weird looking sizing things aren't what it really looks like. Um, yep. but there's also, it doesn't just, it's not just a device, there's an app that goes on your phone, right? So can yep. you talk a little bit about the app and can you also talk about um, whether it's iOS or Android and what the deal is with that? Because obviously yeah. there's... There's yep. a fierce competition in the patient community over, over whether we should have Android or iOS. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, with uh, 
So mobile app, I actually just did a walkthrough um, yesterday or two days ago. I was like, time is just so distorted, but I think I did a walkthrough yesterday that we've just posted to social media. So you can see there if you want to actually see me walking through and clicking through the app. Um, but we have, I mean, we have those, that detailed page where you can see every single stand that happened over the course of the day and see how your body responded. But we distilled that down into a couple of scores to make it more digestible and actionable on a daily basis. So like one of those, for example, is a flow score. Again, I would go to like stat wearable Instagram or or like uh, uh, we just started trying to make TikTok work. Uh, but anyways, you can see on either of those, the um, the... Uh, you can see the app experience there, but the flow score, the idea there is we're tracking um, like uh, your historical standing, sitting, laying, uh, heart rate, flow index, and pressure index. And we're seeing like on a specific day, if you're deviating from that, because let's say like your flow index is particularly low every single time you stand up, then that would highlight saying this is an anomaly for you. You normally have a normal range, but this is an anomalous range. And so it pushed the flow score a little bit lower. And so then the idea there is you just have one score to see, okay, my flow score normally is at an 80, 90, but today it's at 65. You can drill down and see it's because like my, even my laying down flow index was bad. So then you kind of know, okay, now I need to get on top of my electrolytes. Uh, now you have objective data versus trying to sort it out from your very, your symptoms and make sense of like, is it that, or is it like something else, my my MCAS allergy stuff going on, like what is going on? And, and so we're trying to give some more data. Um, and uh, so it's more actionable on like, should I actually even go out to door cancel plans? Because like, it's looking really bad from like, every time I stand up, I'm having a very hard, my heart's having a really hard time. So that's, um, that's, that's a little bit on the mobile app. Again, it's more visual to see if you look at the 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 demo walkthrough I did. The on the iOS Android side. So I I mean this is like just the maybe TMI, but like back when I was at Bose and trying to do it as a startup, Android is extremely difficult to develop for. Um, and it's very costly to develop for because it's so heterogeneous. So you have so many people on different phones, different Bluetooth chips, you have different uh, uh, like um, operating systems. And, and so as a, as a developer to try to support that, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a basic app without Bluetooth connection. And back at Bose, we paid well over a million dollars to get it to support Bluetooth connection direct to Android phones. And so that's a very expensive thing. We're, we, 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 so that's a, that's a scale question is like, how do we reach, we know about 30% of our people that are interested in our product want to be using Android. And we, we, we also, I mean, most of our traffic is mostly iOS, but like, we know like that's a significant portion of people that we want to be able to help, but it's just a very expensive population when, uh, because of the cost of Android. So it, we, we want to support it uh, right now. We are, we did try to uh, see in our, um, campaign page by providing an option, like if we had a thousand, uh, Android, um, uh, supporters, then we would try to start building it immediately. Um, right now, it's not looking super promising because the thousands was it's a little, it seems unlikely. So if it doesn't make it there, then I mean it's likely that we won't actually start to look at Android again until maybe 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 it starts to become a consideration if beta is going super super well and we should scale immediately. But maybe it's a question that we push into 2025. That's still very TBD. Um, it's it's really a finance situation where again a startup just starting off trying to get off the ground and like we we can't try to scale before we can't run before we walk and we're just right now walking so yeah yeah i i definitely want to remind everybody of that like this uh you guys are starting from scratch and trying to develop a really scientific uh you know technical kind of thing and of course everyone wants it to work on every device and in any country and you know, be paid for by insurance and all that, but that takes a lot of time and work. And from talking to you um, for over the past year, it's it seems clear to me you guys are committed to sort of really trying to make this available to as many people as possible. But right now, just having to just having to get it to work and launched, and you know, like you said, you got to walk before you run. Um, so I hope that people who can access it right now, because maybe you live somewhere else or uh, you have a different device or you can't afford it. I hope that you stay in the loop on what's going on with this and that maybe someday it will uh, be available to that, that bigger, bigger audience. Um, some other questions we have here. Um, how do you do the custom fitting? How does that work? Yeah. So, I mean, the primary way right now, which we're, and this is another example of an Android versus iOS challenge is with 
iOS, we have a well-controlled face ID experience where we can do a 3D scan of your ear and just kind of hold an app and then move it a, a little bit. It takes tens of seconds, um, if that. And then and then we take that 3D scan and then we do, like, we have like right now around like 20 different silicone adapters that we then determine which adapter is the right fit for your ear. Um, where when you don't have face ID on Android, like that looks quite different. So we're also experimenting with other kind of not as sophisticated 2D image approaches as well to try to make it, but like it, it's less accurate, but it may be good enough. And so that's another part of the research that's very challenging, but that's more of our problem, uh, re like scientific research question. That's just a try to make stat work question. But um, yeah. that's that's how it works. That's that's currently how it works. And it's we're still trying to figure out ways to make it work for more phones. So um, is there an age limit on this for children? Yeah, so I actually misspoke on this in a previous thing and my team got mad at me <laughs> because uh, uh, we, so we haven't tested at all in a younger demographic. Um, it's, there's, for good reason, like uh, minor, minor, testing in minors has a lot more like good restrictions. And uh, so we haven't, it's only been tested in people over 18. Um, and it's possible that like we can be very off and like actually say the wrong thing just because we've, we, you can't, we have to do the testing for us to have any sense or confidence that's going to work. So that's one part of it. So I, I think with that, like we're not comfortable. We can't say like that we're we're, we're not we can't market to to um, under eighteen year olds. Uh, so that's unfortunately. I mean, we have in, uh, inbound interest from various like children hospitals that want to because like this is a very big problem for adolescents. It's often symptoms of onset in adolescents and. Uh, and a lot of people are missing school for these reasons, and it's it's a very critical time of your life to not to then be stuck in bed all day. So I, we understand like that that's another example of a situation that we want to be able to help. And there's a lot of people suffering from it. This is also again the scale question is like, but that's also in a situation where there's a lot more uh, like validation work. There's a lot more. Um, it's a lot harder to get to that point in that. So it's it, it's a, again a scale question. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think. Like long term, like a lot of things, the answer is like maybe someday, but we need to get there first. We need to to do that yeah. research. And yeah. I appreciate that you are making sure that you are doing that research and rather than just marketing it to them, like when it's not really proven to work in kids yet, because you just haven't gotten around to doing that work. Yeah. Um, and as someone, I do research um, on the side, uh, and it is really, really hard to get ethics approval to do research on children. It's it's good for a good reason, right? Exactly. We don't want. Um, we don't want people doing weird experiments on kids. So there's a lot of restrictions and a, and a lot of institutional um, regulations and stuff, which is, you know, something that you will be able to overcome when you're ready to start studying it in kids. But I think it makes sense to get it figured out in adults and working really smoothly first. Um, so um, some folks are asking if you can't use it on your iPhone, can you use it on your Mac or, or a iPad? Not Mac, iPad, we have, I actually, oh, we've, we've loaded in the iPad. It just looks funny. Um, we'll, I mean, there's enough people, I mean, we'll probably do some valid, like testing to make sure it's rendering correctly, but we will uh, support, we will not formally support it. We may eventually, but we'll, we'll at least you can download and in, in the app in the, in your iPad. It just might look a little bit funky. Um, yeah, but Mac, it does, it's a completely different operating system. But you can't, you can't use your MacBook with it. It has to be iOS, which is iPad, iPhone. On the um, geography question. U.S. territories that aren't in the 50 states? Oh, geez, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, that's also part of like okay. what I, yeah. So I, yeah, I, you, please shoot that email to us, support at sethealth.com, and then we can maybe get a better answer for that. I, we, it's possible. You can try ordering if Stripe lets you, or if the our payment processor lets you. I, I would shoot the email to support. Yeah, so we but can, Daniel, why don't you put the, in the chat, put that email address so that people know how to get, you can go into the Zoom chat and type it in there. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll <laughs> don't, don't go too crazy on the email, the, 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 the support email. This is, uh, you know, if it's the thousands of uh, it's emails, small it's going to be hard. Yeah, exactly. We're <laughs> yeah. a very small startup, so please don't go too crazy. Um, so um, there, uh, here's a really great idea. Um, is there a feature that can notify uh, you and other people if you're not doing well, like a like a setting that can let people know? 
that was a really good idea that oh, we were, we have a, like a Facebook group that we were like getting feedback from various people. And it, that was actually a good conversation, a really interesting conversation that came up. Um, that is definitely on the, like our feature. There's so many features we want to build. That one's pretty like higher up of like maybe giving some level of some level of not, it's not an alert. It's more of a notification or some way for someone else to check in on, see how you're doing almost like your own like care team of some sort. And so that is definitely on the, feature roadmap of what we want to build, but um, there's it's still a lot more things that we need to build before we get to that one. Yeah. So then um, here's a good question. So, so you had showed earlier, like the patients at the conference that were on, you know, fully loaded on medication and electrolytes. And I mean, I get IV saline before our conference completely just exactly. like, no, I don't even normally do that in my day to day, but I have to run a 500 person conference for four days. And I'm like, I need the juice. Um, so, but did you ever test this device or has anyone done research yet on POTS patients who like aren't medicated, who are, you know, intentionally taken off of meds to do the, uh, capture everything kind of testing. That's the Duke test. Uh, uh that's the Duke test and Johns Hopkins, like uh, part of tilt table testing is you need to take get off of what you were doing. And, uh, and so we have that data. Um, we, I mean, it's we're, we finished recruiting um, and data gathering for that earlier this year. We just haven't, uh, Dr. Pradeem and I just haven't been able to connect and finish the data analysis and manuscript writing for that, but we do have that data. Um, uh, um, now, we don't have that data for the STAN test, but that's like the MIT Maestro study, I believe is, I mean, it's also, I think they're actually, that one's still in formation in terms of me getting up to speed on what they're doing, but I'm fairly certain like not everyone's on medication at that point. I don't think they, they're taking off of everything, but um, that's, that's yeah. I think also in, in terms of like getting data on people that are taking a medication versus not, like we're going to have that in the in the app, uh, in this like big orthostat, like, uh, like crowdsourced big orthostatic vitals research study. Um, that you can log whether you're taking something or not. So we also want to then be able to see like how much your flow indexes and some of these scores are changed when you, on days that you have something versus you don't. So anyways, mm -hmm. all that to say, like, like there are ways that we're going to learn that question, but um, the primary one data set we have right now is like primarily Duke and Johns Hopkins. Yeah. I have a long research w wish list for this device. And one of them is I'd really love to know how the blood flow change differs between tilt testing and the 10 minute active stand testing, because, you know, ideally we would be able to come up with new ways to diagnose orthostatic disorders that aren't so, you know, patients don't really like getting the tilt testing. It's hard to get access, like you mentioned. And I yeah. think it'd be really fascinating to see, you know, and also how do those tests correlate to real world, right? Like your day to day, when you're trying to go to the grocery store or pick your kids up at school or something. Um, yeah. But, uh, so here's a good question. Um, if someone purchased the device like a beta tester early access and they get the original model, what happens when the technology advances and there's like a better new and improved version 2.0 device? Yeah. So so that's exactly part of how we kind of design the experience is like, uh, so it's that is like a program. It's not just like a, like a single product purchase. It's a program that does also have a, a like a membership cost. But the part of that is actually making sure that everyone's on the latest and greatest because we're constantly working on feature re releases, hardware upgrades. Uh, like we're going to be working on Gen, what we'll, we'll ship Gen One, learn from Gen One, get uh, more on, uh, get more understanding of what we need to improve, and then we'll be shipping a Gen Two. But we're gonna anyone that has at least six months of membership remaining will be automatically sent for free the uh, Gen Two device. So so like. C continuously being on the latest and greatest is part of what we design it, how we design kind of our our membership like uh, pro, uh, it's a it's a program not just a product so that's 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 how it's so yeah being a being a member automatically gets you on the latest that's great um and there are let's see um how do you charge this ear device uh so we actually have a tiny little micro solar cell on it um this is a Another, I mean, it was critical when I was trying to make it purely for my dad, who's an older person that doesn't engage with technology, because I wanted to put it into his ear and have him totally forget it's there and just it's always there, char self charging and running. I think it's not as like paramount, like fundamentally required in a in like a dysautonomia POTS MECFS population. Um, I think 
it's they look, look a little bit more different than the elderly syncope or the static hypertension population in willingness to engage with data and technology. And so, um, but that said, we still have the solar cell inside of it because um, uh, we basically already figured out how to make all that work. And and uh, and so it's a solar cell that. Uh, uh, so if you get at least like three to, I mean, I mean we're kind of seeing now we need like you need to have direct sun, uh, three to four hours of direct sun every every three to four days, then it'll stay perpetually charged. Like my dad would get that, but most people are probably not. So we also have a, like a optional, like add on carry case that you can just drop it in and then leave that under like on the windowsill. We also have a base station that uh, has a little slot, a ma magnetic slot that you drop it into and it uh, sucks it in and then shines an infrared light on it. And so those, we have three ways to charge. It's like in the carry case, while in your ear and in your base station. Yeah, I was gonna say a lot of the dysautonomy folks are not like super outdoorsy hiking types. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so good good that there's indoor charging available too. Um yeah. so um so uh is the device hearing aid compatible? So so um it depends on where the hearing aid what it occupies. So if you take a look in um so like if it's in the same area. Like for example, we can wear the device and AirPods simultaneously. Um, you you can wear the device and most like behind the ears that like, don't fill fill the like the area that the stat device is in. You can wear those simultaneously. But it's uh, there's a few like in the ear hearing aid styles that, that's not very popular, but there are some that fully fill the area that stat is in, and that that's a problem. Like, we need to not be like stat and if it can like if the mechanical space that it occupies is in the same area, then it's not going to work. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, most hearing aids are actually now the behind the ear type that go into your ears, so yeah. it should. Here's a great uh, question from one of our scientific science patients, uh, who is a, a friend of mine. It's a great question. Have you yeah. ever taken two devices and put them in people's ears and get simultaneous measurements to see if it's different or the same? <laughs> uh, so uh, we so we have well, part of it is left and right actually have uh, different arterial branching. So off of your aorta, the uh, the left carotid climbs right off like the main trunk and then climbs up to your head. Whereas the um, off to the right side at first, there's an a, a artery that branches off and goes to, towards your right arm. And that's what the carotid, the right carotid branches off of. So it's not as direct of a path to the heart. So we chose the more direct path to the heart on the left side. Um, we, well, we also have seen, I mean, there has been differences in left, right perfusion. I mean, there's, it makes sense anatomically why that would be the case, but there's also been some studies, Mr. Van Kampen showed me some very interesting data that I, hopefully they published at some point, but there's definitely differences, flow differences left to right. And um, so we chose the one that is the one that's a more flow direct path. Um, so no, but so that's one thing. The other portion is the device itself is not symmetric. So we can, you can't just take it and put it into your right ear. It, it, it's, it's designed to fit in your left ear. So you can't just do that without completely redesigning and uh, the product, so. Um, a lot of our patients have um, very hypersensitive skin and rashes and things like that. Have you had anyone using this that has talked about like they just can't use it because they're allergic to the material or anything like that? So allergy wise, we are, have we seen allergy reactions? I mean, we've had many different variants of prototypes over the years. And we've been at this for now three and a half years. So on the latest, because now we're kind of getting towards more actual silicones versus like we had various 3D printed, like various types of prototypes over the years. On the latest, I don't recall seeing an allergy. Um, there is, and we've seen some people report some level of itchiness. So we like, but like that, I don't know yet whether there's an allergy component element of that. Um, like pressure, like touching, like it's just putting pressure on a spot that just kind of gets and it gets like itchy and yeah. Um, I, I would say that the material themselves though is, I mean, it's, it's silicone, sil hypoallergenic silicone primarily. Um, and there's some, uh, like, uh, like, like various, uh, plastics, but like polycarbonate is our primary plastic. I know one pe person mentioned corn and we're being careful to not make sure that there's not corn products in our, the plastics that we finally select. Um, so those are the main things in contact. There's not like direct metals in contact. Um, so like nickel, like there's common we know that this population often has comorbid, like severe allergies, MCAS related stuff. So we're trying to be conscious on the material selection. Um, so it's primarily silicones and like pretty inert plastics. 
So here's a question I've seen from a few people. Um, is this only meant for pots or is, or what other, I, and I know you're, you're kind of cautious about seeing it's like for a certain condition, right? Because you're, it's, I'll let you, I'll let you answer, but what, what conditions, what type of people are likely to be interested in this device? <laughs> I think, I think what we've been primarily targeting is whether you have orthostatic symptoms. So if you stand up and you're feeling dizzy, lightheaded, faint, you're feeling, uh, I mean, it also can manifest in like air hunger. Some people call it. There's many things that can get tricked because not enough blood's leaving your heart. And like there's various receptors get that, that get thrown off that you feel short of breath, that you feel, um, uh, so, so like if these are occurring dominantly upon standing up or with the stasis and that gets much more exacerbated by that, like these, those, that's like where we fit into like an orthostatic syndrome bucket, orthostatic symptom bucket. And that's who we're trying to design for. So there's a large percentage of MECFS that has this. So like MECFS is a common one. POTS is directly built into the it's postural orthostatic. It is an orthostatic component, orthostatic hypertension, um, orthostatic intolerance, which by the way, another issue is like, we had this conversation, but there's a huge portion of the population. Um, I think in Novak's literature, it's like 30 something percent. And uh, Dr. Visser Van Campen's work, like it was like upwards of 50% of people that like are going on the tilt, they have a normal heart rate and a normal blood pressure response. So these patients are just like told, oh, you're, you're fine on the current criteria. There's nothing objectively wrong with you. But um, but like, so that's where it's like we, the diagnoses are kind of hard to use as like a, this is who it's for. It's like, if you're experiencing orthostatic symptoms, that's that's yeah. who we're signing for. Like frequent symptoms of lightheadedness when you stand up. Correct. Brain fog it, when you're standing up. It's sustained, up. it's sustained too. Cause like everyone yeah. gets lightheaded when you stand up. I get light, you lay it and stand up in the first 10 to 15 seconds. We also posted the video of this on TikTok, I think yeah. and Instagram, but like everyone gets like a little bit of a dip and that's why like normal or not, uh, um, people that uh, don't have orthostatic symptoms, they uh, will feel like lightheaded in the first like 10 okay, seconds. Okay, we're not normal. We know. Uh, I, <laughs> I, He's trying to be clinically I, correct. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm definitely not normal. I will own that. Um, I, but um, so in terms of, um, so some people are asking, will the device ever allow us to get real-time data? I know, you know, that's, I know that's one of your goals, but what, what does it look like in terms of um, right now and versus future? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it depends on what the functionality of the real time, like it's, it's like pseudo real time in that, like we, every time after we take a measurement, after the measurement, we try not to measure during, uh, we try not to send data while taking the measurement. So like if, if we took a 10 minute measurement or five minute measurement after that period, we then try to Bluetooth sync it and send so that you can view, view it on your phone. Um, so that's like pseudo real time, but it's not like in the moment that is occurring that you can like decide, oh, I need to sit down before I pass out. Um, because it kind of happened 10 minutes later. Um, uh, but uh, if you're talking about the use case, which uh, is, I mean, how we initially were imagining it for my father of like, he doesn't detect this fainting. He can't really sense it coming. He's always dizzy when he stands up. So he just kind of keeps pushing through it. And then he wakes up on the floor. Like that situation is a much more like a very compelling, very useful situation that like, I that's why I want to design it for, for my dad. But it's it's very it's a much longer path because that becomes more of like a medical alerting system and there's different regulatory requirements for that. So we, we want to get there. Like I want to be able to create that functionality, but that's a multi-year journey with a lot of regulatory hurdles and a lot more validation. And it's more critically, like if it doesn't happen and like you were depending on it, like that's, that's a bad false negative. And so there's kind of like, we've, we've shown that SAC can see it and see it before it happens, but there's a long journey to get from proof of concept to like a functionally useful, reliable product that you, that, that can be used and depended on. So like that's on the roadmap as well, but it's like kind of a longer term roadmap because of likely regulatory requirements and good reg regulatory requirements, like, frankly. Yeah. Like, I, I think it's important for everybody to know, like, like, uh, this is a device and there's, there's FDA regulations on devices, but if it was like a pharma drug, right? Like when someone has a new idea, for a new treatment that they think might help hypothetical might help POTS. We have a new drug. We think it might help. It's usually like 10 years and over a hundred million dollars of research before a patient can ever get that at the pharmacy, you know? So it's, it's a long journey to start a company in healthcare that's trying to do something new. And um, I feel like uh, you guys have been very transparent with us and 
really taking a lot of feedback, you know, even before you were publicly launched your website, we had talked to you for almost a year and working, you know, I'm really happy to see you guys working with like really credible top researchers to make sure that this is legit and that it really, you know, is doing something meaningful for patients and not just like spouting out some numbers, you know? Yeah. So I, um, I, I want, I don't want to hold you up all night. Cause I know, um, it's getting late there and, uh, you're in Boston, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm in New York and, and we have people tuning in from like all over the world, which is kind of oh, cool. like at 3 a.m. Someone calling in at 3 a.m. Thank you <laughs> yeah, for listening. <laughs> yes. So um, I thank everybody for tuning in. There's there's um, I did put in the chat. Uh, if anyone is interested, I'm not like hawking this product or selling it or telling you you have to buy it. But if you are interested, um, dis, uh, Daniel gave Dysautonomy International an affiliate link. We don't make any money off of it. What we did is um, Daniel is, uh, Stat Health is going to donate for every 10 orders through the Dysautonomy International link. Stat Health is going to donate one free device to a person who has an economic hardship. And eventually you will have a, uh, an application process for that, right? To, for yeah. people, because we know that, a uh, a lot of people in our patient community cannot afford this, or maybe could afford the device, but the long-term maintenance thing is, is a hard stretch for people. Um, and so trying to make this available to more people, if you, if you do have the means to do it, uh, through our link that helps someone else, uh, get access to the device, which is pretty cool. So I thank you, Daniel, for, for doing that. Um, so that's in the chat, the links in the chat. And, um, when is your, uh, where are you in terms of the, the pre-orders and the crowdfunding? Like when, when does that end? Is that, um, got a, a like due date? This, this, this weekend, actually, um, okay. I think it's, I think we're ending this Saturday night. So, um, yeah, so actually very soon. So if you're interested, I mean, no pressure. This is like, it's, it's, this is not for everyone. It's kind of like an early adopter, like crowdfunding phase. So like, I wouldn't, if you're not comfortable with it, I actually, please like, uh, just wait until we're kind of further along. If, if, uh, but, we, if but like, if you're on the yeah. fence, wait. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't push um, it. Um, like, uh, but if you, if you want, there's like a crowdfunding special and a deal. Cause it's like, you, you're putting like, you're, yeah. it's a much, the product you're not, you have to wait till like July now, I think, or some, something like that for the, for the current phase of shipments. So yeah. it's a, it's not a, your normal purchase, but that said, it, you do have a special crowdfunding offer right now. Yeah. So one of the last things, uh, there was a question about it. I meant to pick before, and I really wanted to emphasize this. Um, right now, like we don't have, there hasn't been research yet to show like if your blood flow to your head isn't so great, uh, you can take drug so-and-so and make it better, or you can drink this much fluids and make it better. Like we, we need to do more research on this device to see how the blood flow to the head responds to different interventions, different treatments. Right. And I yep. feel like as a patient, like when I have that info and I know, oh, if I do this particular thing that gets my blood flow going better and reduces my symptoms, that that is really actionable data for patients, which I think is going to be key. So I, I hope I'm, you know, fingers crossed for a lot of research, not you are, you obviously have research to do to improve the device and make it work the way you want it to work. And, and everybody else wants it to work. But um, I'm also hoping that the researchers will um, take advantage of, um, you know, compared to autonomic testing equipment and transcranial Dopplers you get at the hospital, like, you know, a three or $400 device is actually fairly cheap compared to the equipment they usually have to buy. So being able to integrate this into research to see how are these treatments actually uh, changing the physiology that matters in these patients would be, you know, really, really cool to, I'm excited to see that happening. And I know it's gonna uh, eventually, <laughs> but. Uh, quick, quick, quick note. Uh, I just saw in the, the Q and A that if you just sent the, that link to hosts and panelists, so I see it, but no one else does. So you might. Uh, oh no. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Okay. Sorry yeah. guys. I'm a dope. I put that link there like a oh, half good. hour ago. Um, thanks. So, so brain um, fog. I need to hey, check my blood flow. Well, I'll see your flow index. <laughs> um, so, so, um, commenting on that, like, I mean, that's exactly what we want to do. That's like part of the, like super exciting, like there are an infinite number of permutations and research questions that we want to answer. Like we're so tapped out. Like there's many people that want to do research that we would love to do, but it's, we're it's tiny team. And so we have to kind of pick and choose the different research. But once we kind of provide the device to people, like there's like there's a more of an opportunity for people to, I mean, 
like we're going to be doing large scale research and like testing so many different permutations. That's kind of like what we're trying to do in this. So uh, it becomes crowdsourced research and you can do it yourself too and start to tell us and we'll learn around. Uh, well, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing communal learning experience. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I think I've actually kind of had fun learning with you guys and talking to you and watching you guys learn from patients and from other researchers. Like we've worked with other companies that are trying to develop dysautonomia oriented products. And very often they come in and they say, we've done all the work. We have the answer. Here you go. You guys all need to take this drug. And it's like, you know, you guys have a very different approach. I, I like it. It's um, more collaborative and learning and really trying to develop something. I mean, the fact that your dad has this stuff, you know, like trying to develop something that actually helps people and gets them info they can use to to improve their functioning and their quality of life is, is I think, really cool. So anyways, with that, I will let everybody go. I just want to mention again, the link in the chat, Dysautonomy International does not get any money out of this. We're not trying to sell you. It's just, if you want to, if you want to order, it's a nice link to order from because for every 10 devices ordered, uh, one device is donated to a patient with an economic hardship. So that's where where that why that link is in there. Um, and so we will email this recording out to everyone. It usually takes us about a week or two to package it and put it in an email. Um, and that pre-sale thing is till you said Saturday night, right? Yeah. So also check out the website. There is a lot more info on there. There were tons of questions we could not get to. But um, there's more info on the website if you do a little digging. So, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, Daniel. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody thanks else everybody. for coming in. Take care. Thank you for listening.